Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Well, howdy. howdy. It's good to see you guys. Welcome to Faith Bridge. We're glad you're here. Uh, welcome to everybody at the Woodlands campus, online, South Korea especially. Uh, we're so glad all of you are here. So it's awesome. Uh, if you have a Bible, we are in Luke chapter 19. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, ushers are coming uh, all around the world to pass those out. And, uh, and uh, so you can grab one. Luke chapter 19. I want to read to you a couple verses Uh, We'll pray and then jump in together. Luke 19, beginning in verse 1. Uh, Speaking of Jesus, it says this. He entered Jericho and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. And so he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He's gone to be the guest of a man who's a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, today, salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. Let me pray for us. Well, Father, I want to thank you that while we were lost, Jesus came seeking us. And Lord, I want to thank you that that happened through people, people who decided to initiate and come to us and say, can I talk to you about what the Bible's about, what, what God's about. Thank you for that. For many of us here, that's our story. Someone came to us with a message about who you are, God, and what you're like. And I pray for all of us, whether we would say we've come to know you and love you or whether we wouldn't say that about ourselves at all. I just thank you that you've put us here now to learn about, to see this seeking and saving God and see what it is you have for us, God, that you want to grab hold of us and you want us to make, you want to make us like you. And I just pray, God, that you would, uh, you would teach us what you have for us today that it wouldn't just be attendance of a service. We would be different as a result of this time. And, and I can't manufacture that. And so we're asking you for grace. And, and I just want to invite all of you, if you're willing, to take a minute and ask him that. Say, Lord, please teach me something today. <clears throat> and then if you would, please pray for me, that the Lord would use me and I'd be helpful to you. Well, Father, we love you and we trust you. Use this time, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, this is a great time to be a fan of Aggie football. There you go, farmer's fight. Uh, And uh, I went to the game a few weeks ago when we played Arkansas up in Arlington, and it was insane. Uh, We won in overtime. It was crazy. It was one of the most memorable football experiences of my life. But probably equally memorable for me uh, was my walk out to my car uh, when I passed by about a dozen or so young men who were being arrested in the parking lot for what appeared to be a fight that broke out between Arkansas fans and Aggie fans. Uh, And as I was walking through these young men, uh, I remember making eye contact with one of them and just the thought coming to my mind like, did you have any idea when you woke up this morning that this is how your day would end, you know? That you're like, hey, let's go to a sporting event for fun. And then here you are handcuffed to a tree. Like, did you have any idea 
it would play out like that. And then it just struck me how quickly that escalated. That a friendly, happy us versus them quickly became something so ugly that could radically impact your life. And you go, well, why are you talking about this? It, it's not because I'm concerned many of you are going to get in a fight in the parking lot. <laughs> but it's because we live in a culture of outrage. And you see it in the news. I just called out headlines recently. Outrage over U.S. airstrikes in Afghanistan. Middle school fight prompts outrage. Cosmo Magazine's cover of the Kardashians draws outrage. Unsafe trailer load on the freeway sparks outrage. And it's amazing to me that things as distant as airstrikes in Afghanistan to Kardashians on Cosmo all engender outrage in the community. We're really overusing that verb. <laughs> and yet the reality is the news is going to keep churning out stories like this. Why? Because they know that there is energy when you can get a group of people to marvel at, mock, or rage against another group. Because us versus them sells. There's something in us that likes the idea to group up with like-minded people and then mock or rage against the thems. There's something in us that loves to do that. Let's lob bombs at those who disagree. And my concern is with an election cycle coming, all this just gets amplified. As our culture promotes, silo off, let's do us versus them, Democrat versus Republican, pro-life versus pro-choice, conservative versus liberal, black versus white, LGBT versus evangelical, red state versus blue state, country music lovers versus people with taste, and on and on it goes. I didn't hear as much outrage, more mockery out of you guys. I don't know. And here's the deal. There are very real issues about which we very truly and profoundly disagree that we should be able to discuss. And yet here's the reality. Productive, healthy discussion gets lost in name calling and raging. It does. And in a culture like that, the ugliness escalates so quickly. And some of us, we can look at that and go, I know, Ben, right? Shame on them. <laughs> but the truth is, if we looked at your Twitter feed or your social media or listened into your conversations with your friend, how often do we just sort of marvel at and mock and rage against the thems, whoever they might be? How much do we enjoy it? There's something in us that loves to dismiss a group of people as stupid, ignorant, right? Right? And yet the us versus them culture breeds ugliness so fast. It's interesting. There was a dentist recently. He killed a lion over in Africa named Cecil. You probably saw this on the news. This dentist went over, decided to kill a lion. I'm not defending what he did, but what happened is people found out that story on the news and they began to mock him online. And that mockery online got picked up by late night talk shows and they would mock him on late night talk shows. Over 6 million views of Jimmy Kimmel making fun of this guy who killed a lion. And then as they made fun of them, it became outrage and all along the internet, there were people now calling for his death, calling for him to be hanged. And then in that context, they started posting his home address where you could find him and his wife and his kids. And you go, that escalates so quickly and to I disagree what you've done, to I'm going to make you and your family unsafe. I watched a commentator on the news the other day, and he was debating ideas about deficit reduction. And he said about people on the opposing view, he said, I wish they were all effing dead. About deficit reduction. And you go, there's this reality when we foster a community of us versus them, what happens? I have to destroy the thems. And we may not want to do that physically, but we'll want to do it emotionally or socially. Let's ostracize them or financially bankrupt their business. And then all around the world, it has escalated to our us's will kill thems. That's a human story. And it's the story of our planet. But let me tell you something. There has to be another way. And there is another way. 
And for the people of Jesus, we take our cues from him and he shows us another way. And so last week we talked about someone who was an outsider on religious circles. And the message last week was if you feel far from God, Jesus is coming to you if you admit your need that Jesus welcomes the outsider. If you feel far away from God, he's coming for you. And now this week, I wanna talk to specifically the Christian of how do we follow him in that? That we're gonna get to watch how Jesus treats the other, the them. And it's a blueprint for how we're meant to in our offices, in our schools, and in our neighborhoods. And so you see in verse one, as it sets the stage, it says, he entered Jericho and was passing through. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. He goes through the city of Jericho. And then in verse two, Luke intros a key character and he says, and behold, look out. There was a man named Zacchaeus. And in verse two, Luke tells us two things about him. It says, and he was a dentist who killed a lion named Cecil. (laughs) No, it doesn't say that, but he was at least as unpopular as that guy. Because it says he was a chief tax collector and rich. And in case you missed it culturally back then, to put those two words together would have meant that this man was extremely well-known and extremely disliked. Because to be a tax collector, you secured rights from the Roman government to extract taxes from your own people. He was a Jew that would exploit the helplessness of the Jews by taking their money on behalf of the occupying state of Rome, right? And you go, how does that guy become rich? Easy, you do what a lot of tax collectors did there. You put a heavy surcharge on taxation so you can become rich. So you exploit the helplessness of your people so you can become wealthy. That's what you do, right? So as we meet Zacchaeus, this is not a sympathetic character, This is a guy who flew his banner real clear. I care way more about me than I do about you. And if I can exploit you to make me rich, I'm going to do it. That's Zacchaeus. And in a culture like that, they couldn't hurt him physically. It's protected by the government. So they do what they can, which is we will try to hurt you emotionally by ostracizing you socially. You're a them and you're not welcome with us. And yet, you see in verse 3, something unexpected about a guy like that. It says, and he was seeking to see who Jesus was. That guy has an interest in Jesus. And you go, why? We have no idea. I mean, we know he heard about Jesus, obviously, and then he's seeking to know more. But what's he heard? We don't know. We do know at this point Jesus was famous, and Jesus was famous for primarily two things, miraculous healings, and so maybe Zacchaeus just wanted to see the show, and he was also famous for his message of preaching that God is welcoming anybody and everybody who will admit their need. And maybe it was the attractiveness of that message of power, seeking the impoverished. There's something beautiful about that. We're not sure. But what we can say is that you don't go out seeking if you're satisfied. You don't seek for food if you're full. Seeking assumes lacking. And it says this man was seeking to find Jesus. Why? Because he knows he's lacking. And that's our first point on how to treat the other, the people distant from God and from us and our people. The first thing is, is you avoid making assumptions about what's going on inside somebody because you don't know. This guy had money. This guy had power. And so you could look and go, he's got it all, but he doesn't. There's something missing inside of him. It wasn't enough. It never is. Lady Gaga has 54 million followers on Twitter and has a ton of money and fame and power and all that stuff. But if you go onto her Twitter page, that the first banner picture you'll see is some words scrawled on a wall and it says, sometimes I hate myself. That's what she feels like she needs to tell the world. That in the midst of that abundance, there's an emptiness. And I don't know if that surprises you. To, um, some of us, it doesn't. But for the rest of us, we need to hear that, that we can't make assumptions about what's going on inside of somebody. You don't know. As put together and happy as someone might feel in their lifestyle, they might be aching inside. Zacchaeus's go seeking because they're lacking. And so I want to encourage us, if there's a propensity in you to criticize, for many of us, there are. Some of us, maybe you didn't even want to come to church here. 
Because you go, I don't want to go to church. They're all hypocrites. You go, because I knew a guy, maybe you knew a guy here, that you go, man, I hear the way they talk to their wife. I hear the way they joke with their coworkers. I hear the way they're cruel to people. And then I see them in here worshiping. And you see the way they live on Friday night and the way they live on Sunday morning. And you make a diagnosis. The dude's a hypocrite. The dudes are fake. All you dudes are fake. And you dismiss them all, right? And let me say something. That's a possible scenario. Maybe a plausible scenario. Maybe there are some dudes in here that are really fake. They come in here and they sing the songs and they're just playing games and living crazy on the week and don't care. That's, that's a plausible scenario. But before you wave your hand over all of them, let me tell you something. There may be a guy that was out there drunk Friday night because he's trying to mask the pain. And he's out there trying to drink it down and he's here not to play games. He's here seeking because he's lacking because what he's been doing all week he knows is not working. If he's here seeking Do you really want to fold your arms and judge and dismiss that man? Or you look around and you go, man, some of these people are just so judgmental. They got their religious little rules and they judge other people. And you know what? It could be because they're jerks. There could be some religious jerks in here. That's a plausible scenario. (laughs) Or it could be that they grew up in a house that was chaos and they've gripped onto some rules for a sense of safety. Or it could be that they grew up in little rules and so when they come around you and you have less of them, you scare them and they don't understand what it is to know that they're loved by God and resting in the love of God makes them free to love people, even people they disagree with profoundly. They don't have that sense of security yet and so the reality is they're struggling but they're here struggling. Do you really want to wave your hand over them and dismiss them? Zacchaeus's seek Jesus's. Do you want to be the person trying to bar their entry? I don't think you do. So don't make assumptions on what's going on inside somebody. We don't know. And so Zacchaeus comes seeking Jesus. But then he's got a problem. It's actually a combination of two problems in verse 3. It says he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. That's the problem. Large crowd, little guy, right? Now, we tall people don't really understand this, but the short tell me it's a real problem. Actually, I never really thought I was particularly short, uh, but then I went to a wedding once, and I remember I was standing around with a group of guys, and one of them told a short joke, and everyone was laughing, and he was like, ah, yeah, sorry, Ben. And I was like, ah, what? What do you mean, sorry? Uh, and then I look back at the pictures later. We all took a picture with our arms around each other's shoulders. My arms were up here like I'm riding a chopper with ape hangers. I'm like... Oh, man. But the upside of being small is it makes you resourceful. And so you see in verse 4, it says, So he ran on ahead and climbed into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. His solution is, I'm not getting through this crowd. So he runs to get a better vantage point, and he runs up to a sycamore tree. Sycamore tree, because they have low, flat branches, so a little guy can get up in there and climb up on that tree. And what you see from this guy is he's not trying to push forward to meet Jesus. He's not trying to get in the VIP lounge. He's got some distance. He's staying in the back and he's just trying to see him, right? It's like sitting in the upper deck or the the back row in church. Going, I want to come check it out, but I want a little distance, right? And I get that. Uh, I do that. (laughs) Anyways, but... It's not just his savviness that's on display with him in that tree. You got to see this, man. There's a humility to it. There's a humility for that grown man to climb up in that tree. Because to do that is to risk being made fun of. It's to risk vulnerability from that crowd of them going, what's that guy doing here? He knows what the crowd is and he knows he might face rejection. It's a vulnerability to his crowd when he goes back to his buddies and they go, where were you? You went out to see Jesus? Are you serious, dude? What, are you getting religious on us? Like He's risking vulnerability, but that sense of need is strong enough and he's not too proud to get in a tree. And some of you, I just want to recognize to show up in a place like this, there's a humility to that, an admission of need that's been hard for you. And there's a vulnerability to it of I don't know what these people are going to do with me, or if I go back to my people and they find out I'm going to church, they're gonna make fun of me. Or maybe they don't care, go, that's fine, you go. But if it starts to change my life, the way I talk and what I do, they're gonna mock me. And there's a vulnerability, a riskiness 
for you getting anywhere near Jesus. And I want to acknowledge that. And I want to tell you something, that that is the first step in spiritual growth. The people who don't grow are the people who are too proud. And you see, Jesus is hard, not on the religious people. Sometimes people say that. He was always hardest on the religious people. No, he was always hardest on the proud people because they were unwilling to admit their need. But he sees a Zacchaeus up in the tree who's, yeah, made a mess of his life, but look, he's there. He's seeking not trying to get in on the inside. The guy's got no pull spiritually. He just kind of wants a glimpse of Jesus. But what's beautiful is with a humility like that, something amazing happens in verse five. The procession starts to move towards that tree. It says, and when Jesus came to that place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down for I must stay at your house today. It doesn't just snake by. The procession doesn't just go by him. Jesus doesn't just nod at him like, what's up, dude? There's a guy in a tree. He doesn't go past him. Jesus takes control of the verbs. He moves the party towards them, stops, looks up, and then says his name, Zacchaeus. Why mention that? How did he know it? Well, maybe it was supernatural that he just knew stuff about him. Jesus would do that to people, kind of freak them out. He liked that kind of thing. It could have been that. It could have been that he asked about him. Who's that guy up in the tree? It could have been that he heard the crowd making fun of the guy. Whatever way he found out about it doesn't matter. But the truth is, he says his name. Why? To make a statement. I know who you are. I know who you are. You're not just some random guy in the tree. I know what you are. I know what you've done. And I'm coming for you. And so I don't know who you picture yourself to be today or how far you think you are. If I'm just gonna be in the back and I want some safe distance, Jesus comes to the Zacchaeus in the crowd and it's not gonna be popular to the crowd for Jesus to do that. But Jesus moves directly towards him and for some of you, he's moving directly towards you right now. And notice he says to him, hurry up and come down. I don't want you to wait. It's not maybe we'll grab coffee later. Maybe you'll join a small group in the spring of 2017. Maybe I'll get around to it someday. He says, no, hurry up. To Today is the day, you and me. It doesn't matter what this crowd thinks or what they're doing. I'm talking to you. And I want to be in your house. I must be there. I know who you are. I know what you've done. And I'm coming anyway. And not just I'm coming anyway. It's I'm coming specifically. I must. He uses the word of divine necessity. It has to be this way. Why? Because he'll say later, the son of man came to seek and to save the lost you being lost does not make you ineligible to my grace. It makes you the most likely candidate. It makes you the person more than anyone else I want to sit with. And Jesus moves towards this person. I just want to beg you, Christian, in this moment, don't assume things about what's going on in people. Avoid assumptions. But can I say avoid assumptions? But number two, if we're going to follow Jesus, initiate conversations. Zacchaeus would have been fine on the periphery. He was just going for a view. Jesus moves through the crowd to that guy to make a statement. The God of the universe wants you. And we, his people, are meant to initiate like that. And Jesus doesn't launch in with a sermon about hell. He launches in with an invitation to a meal. And I want to challenge you, Christian. Have you ever initiated like that with the Zacchaeuses in your office or your neighborhood or your school? He's coming for them. And we're meant to as well. So I had a mentor that when he was in college was, was a hard partying dude, was in a frat at UT and uh, was really a hard partying guy. Came to Jesus and then realized, man, this radically changes my life. And for him, as heavy a drinker as he was, he realized there's no middle ground for me. He said, I got to get rid of it entirely. But he still was a part of his fraternity. He would come to the frat parties, but he would carry around some orange juice just so they would all know, hey, now that I'm a Christian, my life's changed. I'm not been drinking like you guys. He carried the orange juice to say, I'm not a part of all this. I'm gonna be here with you, but I'm not gonna be a part of all that. And so he was there at the party and he said at one point he would stay afterwards to clean up. That was kind of the normal thing to do. And then he said one of the biggest dudes in the fraternity came up to him. I was like, hey man, you want a beer? And he says, I said to him, you know I don't want a beer, dude. And he said, then he grabbed me and put me into the wall. And he said, I know you don't want a beer. What I want to know is why you've never offered me any of your orange juice. (laughs) 
And here's what he meant by that. I'm very aware of what as a Christian you don't want to do, as a Christian where you don't want to go. But what this guy was saying is, but I've never felt invited by you into what you have. That's great your neighbors know that you're a Christian. That's awesome. Have they ever felt invited toward the grace you have? That's great that your coworkers know that you don't use certain words or don't go certain places. But have they ever been invited over to your place? Jesus doesn't try to get them to the synagogue. He starts by saying, I want to meet with you in your house. Are you willing to initiate with your home? We had a volunteer in our ministry, and uh, the kid was, um, was a hard partying kid, and, and he was the life of the party. He got the nickname The Captain. And he and his buddies lived right next door to a house filled with just sweet, adorable Christian girls. And these sweet, adorable Christian girls invited these hard partying dudes over for dinner. And so these guys came over and, you know, there's like adorable Christian knickknacks everywhere. (laughs) And they said they left the house. When they were leaving, the kid said his buddy turned to him and was like, Captain, they're trying to convert us, bro. (laughs) And he said to him, they're nice. They were nice. So they would visit with them. They were neighbors. They would talk. And those girls bought him a Bible. Nobody had ever done that for him. So he felt like he should probably read it. And he read Isaiah. <laughs> and it scared him. <laughs> and, uh, and he realized my life's a mess. And I know it. And this book is telling me what I've always felt. And he came to Christ and became a volunteer, became a minister in our ministry. Do they feel invited by you? Jesus goes to Zacchaeus. Russell Moore said it this way, and I love it. He said, I wonder how many people don't listen to our gospel message because they assume they don't look like the kind of people who would be Christians, namely shiny, happy Republicans. (laughs) And I love his title for the article. The title was, Could the Next Billy Graham Be Drunk Right Now? And the reality is Jesus goes after the Zacchaeuses. If we are the people of Jesus, we're meant to as well because they just might do what he did in verse six. And they, he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. The idea of being invited in, you wanna come to my house? Nobody comes to my house. <laughs> Nobody wants to have a meal with me. And love like that changes him. And in verse seven, the crowd doesn't get it. It says, and when they saw it, they all grumbled saying he's gone to be the guest of a man who's a sinner. They don't like that. They go, he hasn't cleaned up his life. He's not worthy of Jesus. And they totally miss the gospel because the gospel is Jesus comes to the unworthy. No one deserves to be forgiven and loved by God. The people who get forgiven and loved by God are the very people who admit they're not worthy. So there's no other house he should be at because Jesus understands something the crowd is missing, that it's love that precedes life change. You don't say, well, I'll love my neighbor as long as their life agrees with mine. No, it's the very love of Christ that precedes life change. It produces the change, right? It will change this man. And that's how it always works. We know this, not even from the Bible. Beauty and the beast. How do you go from being a beast to something lovely? It was by being loved, even when you were a beast. And it was the love that made him lovely. Or if you don't remember that one, just frozen. (laughs) How do you take someone who is a destructive force in the community? What do you do with them? How do you stop them from being a community unraveling person? Well, you can drive a sword through their skull. Or you can sacrifice your life in the name of love. And it's love that thaws the frozen heart, right? And takes a destroyer into a builder, right? And that's what happens in Zacchaeus. They just stole it from the Bible. (laughs) You have a man that's a taker. I will exploit this community for me. And even while he's a taker, what happens? Jesus is nice to him. Even though it's socially damaging for Jesus, he doesn't care. He's nice to him. And that display of undeserved love, which is the foundation of the gospel, changes Zacchaeus from a taker to a giver because love produces life change. 
We know that. That's our gospel. And we're meant to join Jesus in that, right? That it's the kindness of God that leads to repentance. And you see it in Zacchaeus. It says, Zacchaeus stood and he said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. This undeserved grace of Jesus changes this man. And he says, I'm giving away half. It was considered generous in that day to give away 20% of your income. 50% is outrageous by any standard. But he says, I used to exploit these people. But if I can be loved even when I was an exploiter, then I will love those who are hurting. Over half my goods are going out this door today. And not only that, he says, and if I've defrauded anyone. And what's interesting, and we won't get into the technicality, but in Greek, there's a way to answer, ask a question that assumes an answer. And so I won't nerd out on it. But what he does is he assumes a positive. He says, and if I have defrauded anyone, and the way he frames it is, if I have defrauded anyone, and I have then I'm going to repay them. And the standard back then in the law was 20%. He says, I repay them four times. He takes the harshest penalty, the one for cattle rustlers, and says, I've hurt some people, and I'm going to spend the rest of my life making it right. And Jesus looks at him and says, salvation's come to this house. That man's the son of Abraham. Abraham was saved by God. How? By works? No. By trust, belief in God and what God could do to a human heart. And he says, this guy is the son of Abraham, worthy of that same message of being lost and then being found. And it's not his giving away of money that made him saved. Jesus makes it really clear in verse 10. The son of man came to seek and to save the lost. The giving of money didn't make the guy saved. It was proof that salvation had come. Because Jesus takes credit at the end. The son of man came to seek and to save the lost. I was seeking you, Zacchaeus. You were seeking me, but you don't seek God unless God first seeks you and puts that desire to seek in you. I'm the one seeking you, and I'm the one saving. And when I seek you and I save you, it changes you, and we see the effects of it. And as Christians, people who say, I follow Jesus, we're meant to seek people. We're meant to initiate with them. And some of you hear this and you go, Ben, that's great. I don't want to make assumptions about my neighbor that their life's all together. I don't want to make assumptions about that kid that's a bully. I don't want to make assumptions about that coworker with a filthy mouth. I don't want to make assumptions about that person in that political party. I don't know what's going on inside their heart. Okay, I want to initiate conversations with them, believing that love produces life change. But Ben, I, I can't save them. I can't say anything that's going to change them. I can't. I feel unworthy, unprepared. I don't have the words. That's Okay that, man, you avoid assumptions. You initiate those conversations. You know that love precedes life change. And then the last thing is, is you rest in the reality that the Son of God does the saving. You don't have to save your coworker. You don't have to save your neighbor, your family member. We don't save anybody. It's the Son of Man who comes to seek and to save the lost. He's the salvation bringer. And as we share the love of Jesus with our friends and our neighbors and our coworkers, we can believe that God will work in their hearts and he does it through us. Kirsten Powers is a contributor to USA Today, a columnist for Newsweek. And she wrote an article a few years ago for Christianity Today. And she started the article by saying, seven years ago, if someone told me I'd be writing for Christianity Today magazine about how I came to believe in God, I would have laughed out loud. She said, if there's one thing in which I was completely secure, it was that I would never adhere to religion, especially to evangelical Christianity, which I held in particular contempt. And she goes on to say that in her 20s, she kind of wavered between atheism and agnosticism never coming close to considering a God who could be real. After college, she worked as an appointee to the Clinton administration. And it was while in the democratic politics, she notes, quote, my world became aggressively secular. Everyone I knew was politically left-leaning and my group of friends was overwhelmingly atheist. To the extent I encountered Christians, it was in the news cycle. And inevitably they were saying something about gay people or feminists and I didn't feel like I was missing much. Then she started to date a guy, and he asked her early on, do you believe that Jesus is your savior? And she says, my stomach sank. I started to panic. I thought, oh no, he's crazy. (laughs) 
And she told him, I don't want to mislead you. I will never believe in Jesus. But then she says, then he said the magic words to a liberal. Do you think you could be open-minded about that? (laughs) And she said, well, of course I'm open-minded. Even though I wasn't at all. I derided Christians as anti-intellectual bigots who were too weak to face the reality that there's no rhyme or reason to the world. I had found this man's church attendance as an oddity to overlook, not a point in his favor. But as we talked, I grew conflicted. On the one hand, I was creeped out. On the other hand, I had enormous respect for him. And I remember thinking, what if it's true and I'm not even willing to consider it? And so she decided to walk into a church and she said she was freaked out by the music, singing love songs to Jesus. She said, but she was drawn by the sermons and the sermon started to get her to read the Bible. And as she read the Bible, she said, after months, I concluded there's not really a strong intellectual case for atheism. She said, if anything, it seems to be lining up in favor of Christianity. She said, but that did not make me want it. I just thought it's the more logically sound position, but I didn't want to have a relationship with God. She said, I thought people who talked about hearing God or experiencing God were either delusional or lying. But one day she was on a business trip and she said, I woke up in what felt like a strange cross between a dream and a reality. Jesus came to me and said, here I am. And it felt so real. She said, I didn't know what to make of it. I called my boyfriend, but before I had time to tell him about it, he said he'd been praying that night and felt we were supposed to break up, so we did. And she said, honestly, I was upset, but I was more traumatized by by Jesus visiting me than by the breakup. I tried to write off the experience as misfiring synapses, but I couldn't shake it. When I returned to New York a few days later, I was lost. I suddenly felt God everywhere, and it was terrifying. More important, it was unwelcome. It felt like an invasion. And so she asked advice from a friend and that friend said, you need to attend a Bible study with some friends of mine. And she said, that terrified me. Only weirdos and zealots go to Bible studies. But she went and she said, I don't remember all that was said that day. She said, all I know is that when I left, everything had changed. I'll never forget standing outside the apartment on the Upper East Side and saying to myself, it's true. It's completely true. The world looked entirely different, like a veil had been lifted off. I had not one iota of doubt. I was filled with an indescribable joy. And I just want to ask you, when you see someone on the opposite side of the political spectrum, do you see an object of your wrath or a potential recipient of God's grace. I think too often, we don't really want to win over somebody. We just want to win. And I want to ask you, conservative Republican, when you see a liberal, Democrat, feminist, do you see an enemy to defeat? Or do you see a potential recipient of the grace of God to love? And can I ask you, liberal, feminist, Democrat. (laughs) When you see a conservative Republican, do you see an enemy to hate? Or do you see a potential recipient of God's grace in your love? The Christian sees that person that way because we know the love of God transforms. That's what our God is into. He's in the business of making conservatives compassionate and liberals holy. He makes thieves generous and prostitutes pure. He makes the lost ones found. He makes the merciless merciful. He adopts the abandoned. He makes the judgmental into the kind. He makes the dirty holy. That's our God. We are meant to join him in pursuing those who are lost. That doesn't mean we're agreeing with them in all things. Jesus says, I came to seek and save the lost. What's the assumption? That the way they're living is not good but that doesn't mean I don't have to be kind. Will we join him in initiating with the love of God for his glory and their good? Let me pray for us. Well, Father, I wanna pray 
and just thank you on behalf of all the people in here that would say, I'm a Christian, I belong to Jesus. Thank you that our story is that when we were lost, you sought us. While we were helpless, you came to our rescue. While we were enemies, Christ died for us. Thank you that grace came to us and made us what we are. I pray, God, we wouldn't just be recipients of grace, but conduits of it to that coworker we've been thinking about all morning, to that person in our neighborhood, to that kid at our school, to that parent whose parenting style we disagree with. Lord, might we see a recipient of your grace through us rather than just an object of our contempt. The culture likes us versus them. The Christian sees a different way. The us's will go to the them's for the glory of God. And Lord, I pray for any in this room that, that doesn't know the grace of the Lord Jesus. I pray they would see there is something wrong about all of us. All of us have gone astray. And yet Jesus comes for all of us, the worst of us, the most wheels off insane and the most conservative and arrogant. He's coming for us. Might we have the humility to admit our need and find that you transform us with your amazing love. Thank you, God, that that's our story. May we be a people who extend the love of Jesus in the same way we received it. And I pray communities, cultures would change because we live according to your principles, not the world's. Lord, may the world be amazed and warmed by the love of Christ manifest through us. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hi, and welcome to Postscript. I'm Luann Riley, Grow Group Director, and I'm here with Bible teacher Ben Stewart. Welcome back, Ben. Thanks. So glad to have you. Yeah. Okay, so uh, week two, you were back, and we looked again at Jesus, and this time with the social outcast. That's right. Um, we had several questions come in, some of them around engaging non-believers, right. um, one around engaging believers, and then one just about seeking God. Mm -hmm. um, let's start with what came in about engaging the lost or right. non-believers. Yeah. Um, the first question says that in the Bible, it says that bad company corrupts good morals. Mm -hmm. um, how do you balance that with saying that we're supposed to initiate conversations with the lost? What does that look like? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, the short answer is what you see biblically is your central community, the one that has the greatest influence on what you think and how you behave for the believer in the Bible is always other believers. But that community then launches out from that position of safety toward the unbelieving world. So even Jesus with his disciples said that. He said, I'm not praying that God would take you out of the world. I'm praying he'll protect you from the evil one, but I want you in the world. And he sent them out, but he sent them out two by two. He never sent them out all by themselves. Uh, he would send them out in community. And as you watch the church grow, it's always in community. The Apostle Paul traveled with an entourage. And so you see believers are always meant to do that. Have a deep believing Christian community that's a source of strength for you. And then from there, you launch out into relationships with the non-believers. And um, I could talk about that forever, but that's the basic answer. Yeah. Okay, good, but, yeah. good. And so um, we talked about engaging people and inviting them to your home and being in community and relationship with those that are lost. Mm -hmm. um, a question came in around, about how, do you, how do you initiate doing this? If it's not something that you normally do you look at yourself and you say, you know what, I'm surrounded by believers. What yeah. does it look like to begin doing that? Yeah, that's another great question. I mean, when I was in seminary, I had a buddy that he would go to the bus stop and he would just walk up to people and be like, you read the Bible, man, what's your deal? You know, and I was just like, How, what is he doing? It was such a nightmare, but like, he was so funny and winsome. Mm, he he would make off. friends with all of, oh, he could totally pull it off. And, and I was never not weird in that moment. I'm like, I don't know how to do that. And I was like, maybe I just stink at evangelism. And I just thought, no, you just got to do it how you do it. And, and, uh, and for me, more naturally introverted, I start with praying. I'm going, okay, Lord, I want to be available and courageous enough to enter these conversations. Will you create them? And what I found for me personally, there's a couple things that have worked. One is, Frank, 
frankly, frequenting places where I can have an ongoing connection mm. with non-Christian people. Because yeah. I work in a ministry, so same coffee shop, same haircut, same, and, and, and after they see you, after a while, you ask about their life, mm. because asking people questions about their life typically shows a genuine interest in them, and you get to know people. And, uh, and in those conversations, often needs will rise, and you go, this is an opportunity, now do I just have the courage to take it? And so I ask God, will you create the opportunity and then give me the courage to speak and be unapologetically in love with you and inviting to people? Another thing Donna and I did, which was maybe the most socially leveraging out scary thing for me, is we just invited all our neighbors to a barbecue in our front yard so we could all be out in, in the street together. And it was hugely socially terrifying for me to sit out there with my barbecue pit in my driveway and go, they might all be watching me from their windows <laughs> alone. And, uh, and they, they came. And it changed the whole dynamic in our neighborhood from being sort of everyone off on their own to saying hi to each other. And, and so sometimes you do go, this is scary, but I'm going to leverage out. But, it's good. Uh, and again, beyond that, I just say pray for opportunities and you'll see them. Mm -hmm. You'll see them in the lunchroom. You'll see them uh, everywhere you go. That's good. And talking about conversations, let's kind of turn now to a question that came in. Um, really about when you have a friend that's a believer and you, you want to address something that you see in their life that's maybe not what God would want for them or what mm -hmm. you see as the best. Um, the question really is, how do you do that without seeming better than them or like you don't have your own problems? Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, Jesus speaks to that. You know, I mean, Matthew 18, he's talking about um, if a brother sins against you, you, you go to them in secret first. So you don't you don't publicly humiliate them. If there's an issue in their life, you go to them privately to win a brother over. And then if they're uh, sort of belligerent or resistant, you, you start to move more friends towards them uh, and then spiritual authorities into their life if it's a really serious issue. Um, beyond that, he also says, you know, take the speck out of your own eye, or excuse me, the plank out of your eye to get the speck out, speck out of theirs. He doesn't say, hey, ignore the speck in their eye because you got a plank. He says, move them both out. Move mm -hmm. yours out first and theirs out. So for me, when I feel like the Lord's call, calling me to confront somebody, I, um, I really go to work on myself first. If I want to have the right motives, I want to have the right words. I don't want to confront them in the way I do it, sort of come off superior. So I think about what I'm going to say. I ask the Lord to let me come. You go, what's the win? The win isn't to prove them they're wrong, but the win is restoration. Mm -hmm. And so I really ask the Lord to prepare my heart for that moment. And then when you come to somebody, I think you, you speak the truth in love. And that's what I tell people is you, you may have a true observation about their life that you need to share them. Funnel it through your heart of saying, hey, I need to talk to you about something that honestly I'm scared to talk to you about. There it's coming through your heart. Mm -hmm. They're going, oh, this is personal for you. And go, um, there's a big part of me that doesn't want to talk to you about it, but... But because I love you and you're my friend, I want to address something I see in your life that concerns me. And so I just want you to know it's coming from a place of concern about you. If I didn't care, I'd go, I don't care. Mm -hmm. You live your life. And then you share with them the concern. Don't make assumptions of why they're doing something. Confront the behavior. When you say these things, it comes off this way. I just want you to know that. And they can say, oh my gosh, that's not my heart at all. And you go, oh, I'm so glad to hear that. I just want you to know it sort of sounds like that. Or they can say, you know what? You're totally right. I have been judgmental or rude or what you know but you don't assume their motive just confront the behavior don't say hey you know what you've been kind of a jerk lately you know you say when you said this it felt this way when you do this it, it sounds this way and so confront the behavior and uh and do it in love good good yeah. okay so there was one part that you just kind of touched on briefly mm -hmm. you were talking about um seeking um, God because he seeks us, talk, right. talking about the seeking. Um, yeah. Can you just kind of clarify or expound on that um, was one of our questions. Yeah, I mean, Romans chapter three says, there is no one who seeks God. He says, no one does good, no one understands, no one seeks God, no, not one. So you go, how many people are out there seeking God? According to Romans three, None. Nobody. You go, what about that guy all alone on the desert island? It's like, I wish I knew God. You're like, there's no such guy. Like, that's not happening until the grace of God moves in and opens our eyes. You know, that's what Paul told the Corinthians. The God of this age 
has blinded the eyes of the unbeliever. They can't see the glory of God in the face of Christ. But the same God who said, let light shine out of darkness, created the sun, is the God that shone into our hearts, right? To see the beauty of God in the face of Christ. So, so we know it's a miracle. People are not out there drowning and knowing they're drowning and wishing someone would throw them a life raft. They, they don't think they're drowning. They don't think they're water and don't appreciate being hit with life rafts. It's mm -hmm. most people's yeah. thought process until God gets a hold of them. And you'll see that in a friend's life where suddenly they're doing all the same things and they're going, it's not working for me. Or they'll know something's wrong where, and before they just kept coming up with bad answers, now they go, I really need help. And there comes this humble, honest search for truth. And when that comes, when Jesus says, when you seek me, you will find me. Hmm. Because why? That very act of your seeking is God stirring in you a discontent, showing you conviction of sin. That's what the Spirit of God does. He convicts, right? And then converts. And so when I see that happening, you go, it's, it's God who's prompting you of saying you're not okay. And the same God who does that is the same God who rescues. So that's why we pray for our friends. Mm -hmm. God, convict them. Mm -hmm. Let them know. Open their eyes that they'd see that they need help and that they have, there's bigger answers out there than, than more money. And, uh, and uh, so when you see someone seeking God honestly and not just a religion that sort of okay is whatever they want to do anyway. When you see someone really seeking God, you know, that's because God's at work on them. Yeah. yeah. So that's what I meant. Good. Yeah. Good. Well, thank you for that. And thank sure. you for being here with us again. It's fun. Thank Donna too. We love having both of you. And yeah. I know you're looking forward to a busy season with three kiddos heading yeah. into the holidays. So um, big for prayers sleep. for you yeah. and uh, <laughs> what an exciting time it'll be. Well, thank you for being with us. Thanks. Okay. And thank you for being with us here today. We'll see you back here next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.